This conference will now be recorded. Welcome. Welcome to the March monthly partnership meeting of the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership, or SCDRP for short. Good morning. My name is Heather McCarthy, and I am honored to serve as the Executive Director of SCDRP. I am speaking to you today from Jacksonville, Florida. So spring is in the air here in the southeast, and it is my pleasure to see all of you trickling in for our monthly virtual gathering. Thank you so much for joining us, and a special welcome to those of you joining us for the first time today. So here is our agenda for today. First, I have an SCDRP staff update for you. Second, a quick reminder that today is the last day to express your interest in getting more deeply involved with SCDRP through committee service. And then we will hear from today's super speakers, Avery Davis Lamb and Susanna Tuttle. Next, a brief overview of member opportunities for the new year, including committees and upcoming monthly partnership meetings. During our April meeting, Derek Frobider from the North Carolina Department of Public Safety Division of Emergency Management will show us the FIMAN tool, the North Carolina Flood Inundation Mapping and Alert Network. And then in the final minutes of today's meeting, we will um, conduct partner sharing one of my favorite times. So please be ready to share collaborative initiatives, research findings, funding sources, job openings, professional meetings, webinars, training opportunities, and other relevant regional news and announcements. An SCDRP staff update. Our current program coordinator, Tina Jackson, will be leaving us at the end of April to pursue her PhD at Purdue University. We will take a few minutes during our April monthly partnership meeting to formally say goodbye to her and wish her all the best in her new adventure. But in the meantime, we have begun advertising the program coordinator across networks. The program coordinator position is currently being offered as part-time, 15 hours per week contract position and ideally the first contract would be for nine months to take us through the next SCDRP annual meeting. We hope and expect that the contract will be extended based on exemplary performance. So the ideal candidate will bring enthusiasm and passion for disaster resilience, impeccable organizational abilities, and fabulous communication skills. We're also looking for a person with a deep commitment to the SCDRP core values of collaboration, learning, equity, and support. So although this position is 95% remote computer work, candidates must be located within our region, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Puerto Rico, or the US Virgin Islands. And I am truly excited to see what new talents, experiences, and perspectives our new program coordinator will bring to SEDRP. So please continue to share this opportunity and encourage applicable candidates within your networks to apply. The link to access the full job description is at the website, sacora.org backslash hiring SEDRP program coordinator. We are accepting applications until this Monday, April 1st, and we hope to have the position filled by May 1st. Today, we have a double feature. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you today's super speakers, Avery Davis Lamb and Reverend Susanna Tuttle. Avery, if you would give a wave. Avery Davis Lamb is the co-executive director of Creation Justice Ministries. Creation Justice Ministries mission is to educate, equip, and mobilize communions and denominations, congregations, and individuals to protect, restore, and rightly share God's creation. Avery has a background in both ecological research and faith-based environmental organizing, studying ecology in various ecosystems and organizing faith communities across the country to, in support of action on environmental justice. Previously, he has worked for Sojourners and Interfaith Power and Light. He serves on the board for the Center for Spirituality in Nature and is a fellow with the Regenerate program at Wake Forest Divinity School and the Foundations of Christian Leadership program at Duke Divinity School. 
Avery has a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and Sustainability from Pepperdine University, a Master of Environmental Management in Ecosystem Science Conservation, with a Certificate in Community-Based Environmental Management from Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University, and a Master of Theological Studies with a Certificate in Faith, Food, and Environmental Justice from Duke Divinity School. Avery's research focuses on the role of religious communities in building climate resilience and adaptation with an emphasis on the virtue of climate hospitality. Welcome, Avery. Our second speaker today is Reverend Susanna Tuttle, also joining us from North Carolina. Susanna Tuttle is the director of the Eco-Justice Connection, North Carolina Interfaith Power and Light, and North Carolina Council of Churches initiatives addressing environmental and climate justice issues as a moral imperative. Susanna received a Master's of Divinity degree with an emphasis on ecological ethics from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. Susanna is a founding member of the Southeast Faith Leaders Network and is an active member of the U.S. Climate Action Network. She currently serves on the executive board of the Southeast Climate and Energy Network, or CEN, and serves as an international community outreach coordinator for the U.S. Climate Fair Share Collaborative. Susanna lives on a gravel road in Orange County, North Carolina, with her husband, who is a builder, gardener, and musician, and their beloved dog. Avery and Susanna are going to tag team today's presentation, and we will begin with an introduction from Avery, followed by site-specific details, stories, and lessons from Susanna. Avery and Susanna, a warm welcome to you both, and big thanks for taking the time to share your knowledge and experiences with our partnership today. Great. Thank you so much, Heather. I'll get us going here with my slides. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present Avery Davis Lamb. Okay, can you all see my slides all right there? Great, okay. Hey everyone, uh, Heather, thanks for the introduction and the welcome. Really good to be with you all. I've heard amazing things about this, this community of practice um, and sort of been on the margins and it's exciting to be gathered with you here this morning. Um, so, as Heather said, we're going to share a little bit this morning about some community-based resilience work that we are undertaking in the Mid-Atlantic and Southeast. Um, it was a program funded by uh, the NOAA Office of Environmental Literacy, and I'll share more about that in just a moment. Uh, but the program title is Participatory Education in Faith Communities for Climate Resilience. And these are a number of our partners, of course, Susanna with the uh, North Carolina Council of Churches, we're also partnering with uh, community-based, faith-based organizations in both Virginia and Maryland to undertake this project. Heather gave an introduction already to Creation Justice Ministry, so thanks for that, Heather. That spares me this slide, uh, but again, just here's our mission briefly if you're interested in that. So um, this project was funded through the NOAA Environmental Literacy Program through a grant competition entitled Increasing Community Resilience to Extreme Weather and Climate Change. So for a few years, Suzanne and I have been in the work of connecting faith communities with resilience practitioners because we believe that faith communities can be key partners in building resilience and also that often faith communities aren't equipped with the the lenses that are needed to see climate impacts that are coming with the technical tools needed to uh, best weather equip their community to weather the storms of the climate crisis um, or with the connections to folks like you all who are doing this work day in and day out so um, we saw this program as an opportunity to make those connections, both, both through NOAA, but also with cultivating local connections with stakeholders. So um, in, this, in this program, what we've really done is taken the theory of change, the uh, community resilience education theory of change through the NOAA Office of Resilience, which I find to be really amazing and pretty compelling around best practices for facilitating community-based resilience. If you all haven't looked at this, I encourage you to do so. So 
<coughs> to take these best practices that have developed through a decade of granting and then for us to think about how can we apply these and interpret these within faith communities. So that's that's what we're doing. The problem that we're looking at here is that, um, as we know, coastal faith communities, like other communities, are at great risk from hazards. Like I said, faith communities often don't have the knowledge, skills, or confidence to understand science. Often they don't have the ability or the connections to engage in civic processes. And that means that there are barriers to them building resilience in their communities. And we know, we know, uh, we've seen it, that coastal faith communities can be key assets in building resilience, but often haven't, haven't received the requisite investment or resources from local, state, or federal governments to build the environmental literacy necessary to be those assets. And then finally, Resilience education, especially for faith communities, especially in marginalized parts of our states, uh, when it's presented from solely a scientific or technical perspective is inaccessible and it seems irrelevant for our faith communities. So then what? Well, for us, faith communities need opportunities to build social cohesion with each other and with resilience agencies. You all probably know that the best pathway to a resilient community is building social cohesion. And then the second is to cultivate educational experiences that are rooted in experience, storytelling, and cultural and religious traditions with science woven in so that we can effectively build resilience, knowledge, skills, and confidence. So our overall goal for this program, this is a three-year program that started in May of 2023 and will continue through April of 2026. The goal for this program is to create networks of faith communities that are educated on the realities of climate change and are able to serve as hubs of social and physical resilience for their community. And we're taking this goal, we're um, undertaking this work through three phases, and these map onto the three years of our program. The first phase is social learning on the connections between community experience of extreme weather and the science of climate change. So we've spent a a good portion of the first year just engaging in listening sessions with the communities, hearing what their experiences are, collecting that information, that data, that um, community level experience, so that then we can design social learning workshops that really center their experience rather than uh, centering science or data. The second is facilitating these workshops in which faith communities engage collaboratively with local scientists, planners, and decision makers around climate resilience. And then finally, moving toward a resilience implementation and educational project that both moves forward some resilience priority at their location, but that also ensures that there will be ongoing resilience education within their community. The outcomes that we're looking to through this project, the first one is increased social cohesion and networks of accountability between faith communities, planners, and decision makers. The second is that those faith community members are educated and that they have the knowledge, skills, and confidence to understand and reason about the interaction of human and natural systems, especially in their local context, and that there's a specific focus through this on the inequities of climate change vulnerabilities. The third outcome is that those members are empowered and prepared to educate their communities about climate impacts. They're able to participate in civic processes both around adaptation mitigation as well as resilience, and that they're able to serve as trusted community leaders whenever inevitably climate disasters occur in their community. And then finally, sustainability, that congregations have the infrastructure, both the physical and the social infrastructure to continue integrating resilience and climate change education into the life of their church and local community. So I want to close by just sharing the locations where we're doing this in, and um, Susanna will dive more deeply into our North Carolina location, but we're partnering with uh, partners in Virginia and Maryland to work with faith communities in Matthews County, Virginia, which is uh, Southern coastal Virginia with Wacomico County, Maryland, particularly around the Salisbury area. And you can see the, the orange dots here are some of the faith communities we'll be working with in these areas. And then our locations in North Carolina are in Pamlico County, North Carolina, 
and in Beaufort County, North Carolina. And I'll hand it over to Susanna. Thank you so much, Avery, and thank you again for Creation Justice Ministries serving as the uh, lead PI uh, grant uh, facilitator for this process because um, I am part of an organization that actually does not have really the capacity to apply for federal grants. And this is one of those scenarios where um, you know, when you're working with communities and you're, you know, especially now with um, all of the funding being made available, I think we all are probably having conversations with regards to the fact that, oh, there's more money than ever. And, you know, communities should be accessing these funds. But the reality of actually applying for a federal grant is a pretty big deal. <laughs> and um, for those of us that are working in community and, um, you know, doing the work, uh, it's it, managing the project can be very challenging. So again, um, big kudos to Creation Justice Ministries for making this project possible. So I am going to attempt to share my screen and, and then we're going to move into conversation. I hope, um, because that's what this is really all about. So share my screen. I am, we practiced this. Let's see here where I can do this entire screen. Oh my gosh. Okay. One moment. I'm going to make sure I can find this. Here we go. Okay. I have it. I did it. Where did it go? <laughs> um, one moment. And last worst case scenario, um, I know that Heather has a copy of the presentation, so I don't know where it went. I'm so sorry, Heather. Even okay. though we I tried this, I can see it on my screen, but I don't know where it is. Hmm. I'm ready to make it happen for you. Go for it. Okay. I cannot find it. No problem. That's why we have a backup. Yes. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay. There we are. Wonderful. So, um, yes, as Avery uh, shared, um, it's really, really wonderful that we're able to uh, to work collectively across these three states uh, with North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. I know that North Carolina is the only official state in the SCDRP network, but we're um, in the process of getting a lot of lessons learned as we look at three really different locations, but um, at groups that are uh, experiencing the same affects of sea level rise, flooding, et cetera. Um, so we identified Beaufort and Pamlico counties in North Carolina as places that really had not yet had the resources that other um, areas have uh, have benefited from across the state. And I'd love for anyone on this call, um, I, I'm finding increasingly that there is a lot of engagement in these two counties. Um, and uh, especially through the network that I'm involved in called Insider, which is a North Carolina Inclusive Disaster Resiliency Partnership. We just had our meeting this week and it's just been an incredible resource um, for me and and for everyone across the state really uh, to um, to learn who's working where and how we can share best practices across the board um, across the state so um, next slide so all of these photos come from uh, our tour um, that my colleague and I took um, back in October so when this project kicked off uh, I had not personally, this is an example, I'm being very transparent with you all, you know, we're, we're, I'm based in the Triangle, the North Carolina Council of Churches is statewide, we are comprised of 18 denominations that equates to roughly 6,200 
individual congregations, 18 denominations, 6,200 congregations, which equates to roughly 1.5 million North Carolinians. So we use those numbers when we draft letters to the governor and when we do advocacy work for policy-based initiatives. Um, that said, I will admit, not every congregation that is a member of a denomination that is a member of the North Carolina Council of Churches even knows that we exist. Raise your hand if you have <laughs> relative <laughs> data like that. Um, so St. James Episcopal Church, for example, um, is a member of the Episcopal denomination, of course, of the Eastern Diocese of North Carolina. Um, but we do not have a direct relationship with this church. Um, and so what we did is in October, go around and physically just drive before we started trying to do cold calling or try to, you know, um, send an email and say, oh, we're going to be working in your community. Uh, we wanted to physically understand the landscape of where we were going to be working and then then begin to work with maps um, and that NOAA and Creation Justice Ministries in particular, and maybe um, uh, Avery, if you have a chance to drop in your resiliency page for Creation Justice Ministries, mapping the church climate crisis has been something that Creation Justice Ministries has been really a leader on and populating maps with church locations has been one of the ways that we've been able to identify where um, the need is uh, relative to what the science is telling us um, is the impacts in the community. So um, these are our project goals, um, as Avery referenced, familiarize ourselves with the lay of the land and the pot our potential place within it, foster partnerships with local congregations and organizations to achieve those project goals, and then in the long term, build that resilience resiliency um, in the, through faith-based initiatives. So next slide. And thanks for scrolling up. So this, again, these were our site visit goals. And these are the photos that we took as we went around um, learning about the communities that we aim to serve. Um, so uh, the locations for community partnerships and organizing, one of the things that we wanted to be able to do uh, is recognize uh, how folks get around in the community and where the churches physically were located. You can see the sunny day flooding here to the left of this utility truck, um, where uh, just from the visual aspect of, uh, of what life might be like you know, day to day, um, so that as we introduce ourselves, we have more knowledge of the location. And I think that that's really important, um, rather than just, you know, sitting in an office in the Raleigh area, um, again, and assuming that I had any, uh, you know, familiarity with the actual uh, location that we were um, wanting to talk to communities about. So next slide. Again, mapping, and Avery and I had a wonderful meeting not that long ago uh, with folks with, from Union of Concerned Scientists, and they are working with new maps now that I'm excited to bring into this uh, SCDRP in the conversation, and many of you, if you're working with USCS already, that's fantastic. Um, so they helped me understand that identifying not just where the churches were, but where the schools are, where the stores are, the community centers, government facilities, this may all seem, you know, like, oh, well, of course, that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, but it wasn't until I actually got to the community and started driving around. Again, we have the sunny day flooding here. Um, this is uh, just standing water that was in this area, recognizing that the church was there. This is in the downtown area. Um, and again, just the importance of knowing the landscape was like, something that I hadn't really thought about until we really spent some time there. So next slide. So the initial um, findings and observations and the challenges were that um, identifying liaisons in the area to work with um, was not as easy as I maybe had thought it would be before we started this project. Um, and I'll go to our partners moving forward of how really practically overnight this project changed once we identified local community organizations that were going to be our champions moving forward. 
Um, the other piece was recognizing that the FEMA money from the previous storms that had hit um, is drying up, but the projects from several years back, um, which was at least three years, um, are just getting started. And so the community is in this uh, balance. And again, all of you working on resiliency across the Southeast are experiencing this, no doubt, in your own projects. Um, but pinpointing the congregations that will be open to discussing or planning around climate resiliency was um, proving to be a challenge in the early phase. So Avery set, mentioned that this project started um, in May, and it really took us through uh, the beginning of 2024 that we were able to um, figure out how to navigate uh, what we wanted to talk about with regards to climate resiliency uh, relative to what the communities were actually experiencing. And I'm going to speak to that um, in the next, next couple of slides as well. You can see this house was in the process of just being raised. Um, we saw a lot of this as we were driving around. Um, and I, you know, from my own perspective, <laughs> very, very interesting how this would be considered, uh, you know, a great investment uh, at the at the levels of what we see in the science data telling us what is going to happen uh, into the future. So next slide. So opportunities, of course, um, that the community was dedicated, supporting each other everywhere we went. It was wonderful to be able to just walk into uh, community businesses. Um, we saw where the local um, uh, Beaufort County Community College was and went on campus and began to met, meet people. And everyone was really, really welcoming to us, um, which was fantastic, of course. Um, there was a lot of revitalization effort within the local community and congregations. We got to see folks working um, on on uh, rain gardens and different, uh, you know, resiliency strategies that we were excited to see. Um, and then we really recognize that the use of faith-based principles uh, serve as an impactful method to foster unity and resilience. The fact that we showed up in community as um, staff members of the North Carolina Council of Churches was a wonderful way. It was like an entree into everyone wanting to hear more about what that was. Um, you could tell that faith communities are very important um, in as far as communications, and we uh, were received as trusted partners without them even knowing us before we arrived. So next slide. So trusted leadership across Eastern North Carolina. Um, I will drop into the chat after we're done uh, with the presentation. Um, the Pelotot Institute, um, some of you might be familiar with uh, Pastor Dawn Baldwin Gibson. She has been a wonderful partner over many years. Um, I've co-presented with her on mental health issues for the Carolinas Climate Resilience Conferences in the past. Um, and she is just doing an amazing job of building resilient communities across Eastern North Carolina through her work. So um, it became very apparent that it would be completely inappropriate for us to work in Eastern North Carolina without partnering with the Pelotot Institute for building resilient communities. Um, and Avery and I actually had a really unique opportunity to go to um, a summit that Pelotot had put together um, in February. And it was interesting because um, it was using the language of resiliency. Um, I didn't get a lot of information prior to driving to New Bern with Avery early in the morning um, to be at a church all day about what the conversation was going to be. And it actually wasn't about climate at all. It was about Medicaid expansion, health and wellness, understanding um, um, how to have access to health care. And I think it's really important that we remember the language of resiliency means different things to different people. Um, and I was really excited because after I talked with Pastor Don about partnering on this project and having Pelota be the leading um, agency in helping us do, uh, design our listening sessions and our workshops over the course of the next year, um, that she re-described FEMA for me and how they are having are naming what FEMA is for communities in Eastern North Carolina. And she used the acronym of FEMA as 
food justice for F, energy, environment, economy, all things E for E, mental health for M, and A is access to healthcare and housing. And it just really sat with me and um, uh, resonated in what communities are actually experiencing and how they're translating the resources that they need um, into communications that will engage individuals, churches at a whole new level. And I, I was really excited to hear that. And I look forward to talking to my colleagues at FEMA about um, what that means, uh, you know, and how, how engaging that can be. So uh, next slide, the other uh, oh, this was actually, I know, the um, event that Avery and I attended. So as you look at this event, ENC Regional Church and Community Resiliency Collaborative, you can see all of the partners that are there, um, what that meant uh, for us to know that we weren't coming in with outside resources. We were coming into a community that resources themselves, and we, ha we have added value to listen and learn from where they're already coming from. So next slide. Also, the Blueprint North Carolina um, conference took place a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted to find a very locally based organization in Beaufort County that we could look work with um, in partnership with Peloton Ministries and Alpha Life Enrichment Center. We are community. Um, uh, I met the folks that organize these and you can again see um, that they identify as a resiliency based organization look, working at um, farmers markets and community resources, youth enrichment, healthy living, disaster relief. So um, all of this fits into how we learn from communities themselves about how they're defining resiliency and then where we can bring in back to the environmental literacy programming around science-based data and resources and mapping um, to expand upon what they're already doing. So I think that that is uh, close to my last slide. <laughs> Thanks, Heather, if you go through. Next steps, we're going to be having three listening sessions planned between April and June. We're working with Union of Concerned Scientists, as I mentioned, for the mapping projects. And then we will employ members of the North Carolina Council of Churches governing board to serve as communication connectors to local denominations and churches. I'm so blessed that Avery is on the board of the North Carolina Council of Churches. So that's super helpful. Um, and we also have, um, a, well, the total board member is 38 members. So um, having that relationship into the individual denominations that expand up, upon the religious demography of the region is going to be really important. So last slide. That is my contact information and I look forward to being in touch with all of you so I can stop sharing and we can move into a discussion mode. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to share our approach and I'd be really curious um, if others are engaging with communities uh, through the same layers that we are attempting to work through and if you have any additional resources or suggestions for us that would be super awesome again i the phases that we're in is that we're doing deep listening so that we can learn like going to that resiliency session and understanding that um healthcare was on everyone's primary mind especially post covid um, was a really good uh, roadmap in how we can talk about the health and wellness of communities um, and then also we're going to be designing workshops that do have the mapping exercise so people can put themselves on the map. Um, and again, my interest as like, okay, your church is here, you live here, you shop here, you get your gas here, you drive your kids to school here, or the school bus goes in this way. What happens in the time of a storm or in flooding or in any other issue that um, prohibits that from happening? Where do you go to for resiliency or where would you like to see a resilience hub be designed and supported um, and then lastly when I did mention be that we do have some financial resources to apply to the community um, when I talked to Alpha um, uh, the Alpha Center in Beaufort County the first question they asked me was um, can we use that money for chainsaws that was the very first question that they asked me and I said 
Possibly. Yes. Let's move forward and talk about that. Um, and so um, it was just really, it's just been a really wonderful experience. And um, I'm really happy to share this with SCDRP and to learn from more. Thank you so much, both Avery and Susanna. Um, thank you for sharing today. Let's spend the next five, 10 minutes um, with questions. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat. You can raise your real hand, you can raise your virtual hand, and I'll call you in the order in which I see you. And I would also like to point out um, Faithful Resilience Story Maps that Avery put the link to. Um, Mona, I see you said thank you, um, very helpful. Just click on the link and Avery, would you like to tell us about what we will find on that link? Yeah, yeah, so we, we released a, a guide in 2020 called Faithful Resilience. That's a six part guide for faith communities to move through developing an understanding of what resilience looks like and an understanding of how they're their congregation might be able to build resilience. We launched a story map this last year, which incorporated that guide with some of the mapping that we've done that Susanna mentioned. That's an interactive version of that that helps folks look at data, look at maps to understand where they are and um, how they can respond and build resilience in the in their community. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that link. Mm -hmm. And G Gary Harris, I see you have a question. <laughs> yes, yes, Woody, Woody. Uh, uh, congrats to both of our speakers. Uh, you guys, guys do a super job in, in our underserved communities as well as in our faith communities as well. Uh, Creation Care Ministries, uh, I give to you guys monthly, so you're draining me in, in my bank account, but nonetheless, I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, it was Tuttle, you know, I, I, I think you're stalking me. You know, this, this, this is the, the fourth event in two weeks, maybe. But uh, then, nonetheless, again, thanks so much, guys. You, you guys, you guys are doing super super work uh, i'm i'm just over the border in, in in virginia and uh we're working with a, a church here uh and uh what happened was we initially got them to do and, and, and be a part of a citywide health campaign on breast cancer and and, and blood pressure etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and now you know we were nudging them to to be a uh resilience hub and such uh, so 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 they're excited about it the pastor's excited about it etc so uh, what should be the next step i i got him excited you know i i got him you know fired up and ready to go what what should be the next step after that yeah i'll i'll start um, with some ideas i think bringing together the right um, local stakeholders to have a community meeting at the church would be the right next step um, so identifying, you know, who are the technical partners who would be helpful in making physical or infrastructural changes for the church and then um, bringing them together for a conversation that really centers the experience and the needs of the community and then welcomes the local experts as participants in the conversation. Um, and then uh, I'd encourage you to look at the um, U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. We drew a lot on that framework mm -hmm. as a way of designing our workshops. Um, so that might be also a helpful framework for just understanding their five steps toward resilience, um, especially towards the end. It sounds like you've identified the hazards and the vulnerabilities, but some of the resources might be helpful in moving then towards a plan of action. Okay, great, super, thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Gary. Thanks, thanks for all you do. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both. And um, Mona, I'm going to move on to you for your question next, and then we have some questions that are popping up in the chat box as well. Mona. Yeah, I see those interesting questions. Uh, lovely to see you again, Avery. We met at the annual meeting of the American Meteorological Society, so I'm thrilled to see you here and learn from you and Susanna. Great work. So my question was going to be, um, Different faith traditions may have various interpretations of humanity's relationship with nature and responsibility to care uh, for the environment. And I, I wonder what kind of sensitivity is needed to approach different theological perspectives as we build a common ground for climate resilience talks and, uh, you know, kind of in relation to the same question is, um, you know, how do you do you do you encourage interfaith uh, kind of collaboration and how do you go about it especially here in the south uh, southern uh, region um, you know there are a lot of different cultures and and so 
um, I'm also curious to learn if uh, if you see any um, uh, any kind of pushback for climate change uh, conversation or dialogue in faith amongst faith-based communities. I think this is my third question, probably. <laughs> but uh, you know, if 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 you if you approach those those di that dialogue through the lens of social justice, and um, you know, instead of like mainstream weather and climate conversation. So a lot of questions packaged there, but I'm just curious to hear your both of your perspectives there. Thanks, Mona. Susanna, you want to take the interfaith one? Sure. Um, yeah, that's been that's been really important. Um, I am a Unitarian Universalist, and uh, and I work for the North Carolina Council of Churches. And as I mentioned, the 38 uh, member governing board representing those 18 denominations. But above and beyond as well, um, we are learning uh, not just in urban settings, but also in rural settings that um, that COVID-19 really changed the way people um, come together in communities of faith. And um, increasingly, and especially for younger populations, that um, folks are um, in many ways identifying as spiritual, but not religious and in the same way that um, previously we might have seen. And so I have been able to move into spaces or, or come into spaces um, where we honor where folks are relative to how um, how they see themselves as as people of faith. And it's interesting because um, I, I, I love like looking at um, you know, different um, like Pew Institute research, you know, and all these things of like how many people identify as a person of faith and how often people attend a religious service or whatever that means. And um, and I think another, you know, community based listening process is to really hear from folks themselves about how they come together and um, and and what that means. And 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 so the health ministries that are so strong as Gary referenced um, is a way in which like the 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 culture of care is something that I I tend to approach um, and how we care for each other and what it means to love your neighbor et cetera et cetera and I know there was a question in the chat too about like um, we, we tend some of these rural communities tend to um, maybe identify as as um, more conservative and maybe not, you know, out ready to talk about climate change, for example, um, as as language. But when you talk about a, a culture of care and community based, um, you know, I, I like to talk about the work that we do as the "What I Love" campaign. What it, what is it that you love, and what are you willing to do to protect it? And so when we approach in that manner, um, that multi faith perspective. Um, is is a, is something that brings communities together rather than pushes them apart. Um, and the other piece uh, I'll just reference. So thank thank you for that. And Mona, I'd love to talk more and more about that. And um, I, I do I love the the interfaith multi faith um, conversation because this is this is going to be what actually saves our democracy, right? <laughs> when it's all said and done. <laughs> I know we're all 501c3, or I am at least uh, on here, so I won't dive into that too deeply. But um, but we are putting together, um, one thing I will just reference is I'm really excited that we can bring in a lot of the different aspects of our work um, into these spaces around resiliency, what it means to be resilient at the community level. And one of the things we're working on at the Council of Churches right now is a faith values voter guide um, that talks about all of the different issues that folks are really grappling with um, and how we put our faith into action around addressing the issues that most directly impact our communities. So I will just lift up that like gun violence prevention is a very, very important issue around resiliency. And so if, if communities wanna talk about that first, then I am right there to have that conversation. Um, and then how we get into, I think the question around um, the other question of like how how do we be inclusive in these spaces that's what i love about the mapping project um i know we're going to come up on time here but back to 
Um, having people see themselves in their community. Every single person has value and therefore allowing in a community space for that person to show up in their community in relative to a map is, um, is a visibility exercise that I think is really um, powerful. And, um, and then to be able to, to bring in the science relative to that is what this project is all about. And Avery and I are going to be actually going up to the NOAA ELP, the Environmental Literacy Program um, retreat up at the Wild Center in New York. I'm super excited about that. And we're going to be um, giving this presentation. And I think it is one of, Avery, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is one of the very first faith-based initiatives that NOAA has supported through their ELP project. And so I hope we bring in some new ideas um, and reflections in a way in which we do this work, even when we're working with like science and data, that we still are leading with love and compassion for the people and places that we work in. Fantastic. Thank you for the questions. And thank you also, um, Susanna, for uh, you're doing a great job answering questions as we go in the chat box. We've had some great questions from Kamisha and Aly Alyssa. I appreciate um, all of that. I think I do have a few slides that I want to cover before the top of the hour, but I see a lot of interest, Avery and Susanna. So if you would please type your email addresses into the chat and folks can reach out to you with uh, additional questions as they think of them or um, offers for collaboration. And a big thank you to both of you, Avery and Susanna, for taking the time today to share your thoughts and perspectives on engaging faith communities to build resilience, especially in vulnerable areas. And thank you for your efforts every day on the ground and in the communities that you serve. Thank you both. And I have a few slides to share. There we go. Bouncing presentations today. All right, just a few more slides before the top of the hour. Let's take a look at some upcoming member opportunities. Today is the last day to sign up for a 2024 committee. So SCDRP has three main standing committees that meet throughout the year, and I will walk you through those as I share this time-sensitive opportunity. So I, although communities uh, committees do not have the reputation of being fun. I would argue with an SCDRP, they actually are fun. And I really look forward to our monthly virtual meetings, hearing from you, getting little updates on what you and your organizations are up to, and hearing your advice and guidance from throughout the region. Not only fun, but our committees are really productive. It's where we come together as little many SCDRP brain hives to brainstorm, to bounce ideas and generate action pathways to really make a difference. Regional collaboration through geographic, political, professional and cultural differences is not always easy, but it is absolutely essential to achieve equitable resilience in the face of climate change, natural hazards, and disasters. So if you haven't had a chance to participate in an SCDRP committee, please express your interest today with a quick email to scdrp at sakura.org. A quick look at each of our three main committees. First, the Governance Committee. The Governance Committee is responsible for further developing our policies and procedures. The co-chairs from the SEDRP Advisory Board are Rick DeVoe from the College of Charleston and Hilary Lohman from the U.S. Virgin Islands Division of Coastal Management. So please let us know if you would like to join the Governance Committee, particularly if you have experience in nonprofit governance. Next, Partnership Committee. This committee connects SCDRP to organizations, develops joint efforts and initiatives between our partners, and helps identify our monthly speakers. The co-chairs from the SCDRP Advisory Board are Amanda Guthrie from South Carolina Sea Grant and Patrick Howell from IBTS, the Institute for Building Technology and Safety. If you would like to help the partnership expand and diversify our representation, please join the Partnership Committee. 
And lastly, the Development Committee. The Development Committee solicits and generates financial resources to sustain and grow SEDRP services. The co-chairs from the SEDRP Advisory Board are Jim Murley from Miami-Dade County and Holly Schmidt from Jacobs. If you have an interest in how SEDRP receives and sustains funding into the future, please join the Development Committee, particularly if you have experience working with philanthropic groups or corporate foundations. So who's eligible? Committees are open to all current SEDRP members. If you aren't sure if your SEDRP membership is up to date, please check online the SEDRP membership directory on our website, or just shoot us an email. And please express your interest by today, March 28th, with a quick email to sedrp at sakura.org. And we look forward to working with you. I'm very excited to announce our speaker for our April monthly partnership meeting. We are honored to be hosting Derek Frobider from the Division of Emergency Management within the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. Derek is the manager of the North Carolina Flood Inundation Mapping and Alert Network, or FIMAN. Interestingly, this is what um, FIMAN map was showing this morning. I heard a lot of excitement from SEDRP members um, in January about the Feynman tool, and we tried to arrange a demonstration at our annual meeting. However, Derek was already booked and he couldn't make it to Savannah, so we are thrilled that he enthusiastically said yes to show us the Feynman tool virtually and discuss its merits and possible applicability to other areas. So please join us on April 25th at 10 a.m. Lastly, partner sharing time. Let's see if you're popping some announcements into the chat. Um, we have five minutes left. I always end on time. So we have five minutes left if you have an announcement that you would like to make. Anyone? Kate Moreno. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Kate Moreno from uh, the Coastal Equity and Resilience Hub at Georgia Tech. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, we put together a, a brief, an assessment of an issue that we found with the climate and economic justice screening tool uh, in that it excludes smaller communities um, from being correctly identified as disadvantaged. This, for those of you that don't know, is is uh, the tool that the White House Council on Environmental Quality put together to identify disadvantaged communities that are eligible for Justice 40 funding. And it uses census tract boundaries. And so um, some of the smaller communities that we work with here on the Georgia coast uh, get lost in those census tract boundaries when they're surrounded by wealthier communities that have moved in uh, to be on the coast. So we put together a brief sort of outlining that issue. It's short. Um, if you're interested in receiving that, I'd be happy to send you a copy. So just pop your email uh, in the chat and let me know if you're interested. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Um, great work that you're doing. And I know that um, it will be broadly applicable to other areas as well. So thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone for, um, for sharing and please send any additional resources um, and updates that you might have or come upon during the course of the week to SEDRP at Sakura.org. We will also download the chat box at the end if you, added, if you add anything there. And we will make sure to share your resources in our next newsletter. So this concludes our March monthly partnership meeting. A very special thank you to our super speakers, Avery Davis Lamb and Susanna Tuttle. And thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the springtime weather and have a great day.